Welcome to the FBAA's Top Broker Podcast for mortgage brokers looking to take their business to the next level with your host, Joshua Vecchio. Today, we have Hank the Bank Hong for part two, a mortgage broker for Vault Lending Solutions based in Sydney, a multi-award winning broker and one of Australia's most recognized names in our industry. In this episode, we look at how you can stay front of mind with your clients discussing the importance of a solid contact program. By the end of today, you're going to feel empowered in knowing how you too can create a solid business that will withstand the test of time. So let's jump in. Hello and welcome back. I'm Josh Vecchio and we're back with Hank, the Bank Hong. Hank, welcome. Thank you and I'm glad to be back. So Hank, I know one of the things that you value most is a CRM. Why is this? A CRM is pretty much, um, it's, well, if you think about for a broker, we work off our CRM 10, 15, 20 hours a day. That's uh, that CRM, to have a good CRM will allow us to keep track of all our loans, of course, submission, uh, submit our loans to AOL, um, keep track of our clients. And the main thing from the CRM that you want from that as well is commission reports and to be able to pull data from your CRM. So data is a very, very important thing for any broker or firm or actually any business because you've got to be able to track yourself how well you've been doing each month and and to be able to compare yourself how you went 12 months ago. It also allows you to be able to track if you've got fall off in loans, if clients are in arrears, or you've been discharged. So having a good CRM system is probably my number one priority for, and I think it should be a lot for a lot of other brokers as well. So Hank, I know the one biggest issue brokers have is retaining customers. It's once a loan settles, who are they? And do they even know me in 12 months time? You've got a 21 touch point program that is really crazy. What well, how does this work? Um, well, basically, it's the, one of the biggest things for me was I, I learned this 21 touch points from uh, from a well, an established broker when I was coming up. So asking older brokers for advice is very important because if they they they're successful, you don't have to recreate the wheel. You just follow what they did. So I was told about the 21 on touch points, and basically, it's to have the client either see your name or have contact with you 21 times over a year. Um, It it is a little bit uh, excessive, but there's ways that it can be done. So a lot of um, aggregators would have a a monthly newsletter. In that monthly newsletter, they can set out once a month. So there's already 12 touch points. That's an email that's going out to the client automatically. Or also the RBA rate decreases. Some some, uh, aggregators also have a system that pops that out as well. So if you add that up, that's already about 24 touch points just by itself. The The other touch points you want to look at is, of course, their birthdays, the anniversaries, the interest only expiry dates, the fixed rates expiry dates. Um, any kind of reason to still be in front of their face so that they remember you. Because if you, you know yourself, Josh, uh, a loan, loan term these days, a lot of is what, three to four years? A lot of people are refinancing or selling their properties. So you keep contact with the clients um, through lots of different ways, from sending cards, mobile SMS for their birthdays. I, I personally have most of my clients on my own Facebook. And that way, I'm already sending them a birthday message. Um, I'm always chatting to them or making comments on, on their pictures or liking the kids and family and all that kind of side of things. So Hank, one of the things that you do better than any other broker I've seen is really niche and have a specific audience that you target. Hank, what has a niche done to your business? Having a niche, it, it pretty much makes you become a specialist in that exact field. The The way that uh, I was brought up when I was uh, running with a bigger firm before was we were niche based. So we did four, five, seven visas or guarantor loans, anything that just didn't stand and fit in the box. Dealt a lot with uh, peppers. Pepper Money, who did uh, you know the defaults of discharge or anything that was outside the box is something you need to learn. So w- when I think about niche is when I meet meet with a BDM from a bank, they should have a piece of paper saying this is what we do. All banks are all the same up to about 80% right in the middle. 
they're going to do 90% loans or 80% no LMI or PNI interest rate. That's all standard. But what you need to learn from each bank is what they do different to everyone else. That's If you can learn all that, you become a niche broker. So you can deal with uh, you know large acreages or deal with community title. Anything that's weird and wonderful, if you specialize in that, then that means a standalone is easy. To, to be able to have a, a niche is something that you've studied up and that, that's, you know, that niche, you've got all the lenders and you know the lender's speci- actual requirements for that specific niche. So you become a specialist. So anyone else that comes along and just dabbles in all kinds of loans, they will lose to you because you know the ins and outs of that specific niche. So I know you've been shopped around or there's been a couple of times where you've competed against other brokers and essentially you've won because the clients come to you and they felt a sense of conviction that you knew everything there was in relation to that specific loan. And it was a tough Correct. tough loan or tough loan. It is. Um, look, well, look well, one of my specialties is trust loans. The, the good thing is uh, I have actually six or seven trusts myself. So I know the ins and outs of, of that side of things. So when other brokers are competing against me for that client, I already have an idea of, uh, I already know which lender we're going to go with, which, uh, uh, I guess, uh, LVRs and the specifics of that loan product. And also give, not, I try not to give advice because I'm not an accountant, but give them options so they can speak to the accountant and confirm if that, uh, that works for them. So I've studied up a lot on trust. So most of the times I can beat other brokers out on a trust loan. And that all comes to education. I know that's one of your three major points mm-hmm. that you believe a successful broker does. Education. How important has that been to get to you where you were to where you are now in the last seven years? Um, it, it's constant education. When I started um, in this industry, I was told that if you study, you know, two hours a week, so just half an hour every day for four days, two hours a week times by 52 weeks, um, that's about, what? Well, that's 104 hours. So if you studied 104 hours and the broker next to you has not studied 104 hours, you have an advantage against that other broker. So going to PD days, studying, uh, again, the niche side of things, actually spending time and looking and dissecting down a lender and seeing what their niche is and what, what they do perfectly as well. So Hank, with education being one of the foundations of why you've been so successful in your niche, you've also taken this in your business. And there's been a couple programs you've implemented in your business where you've educated it or you've had this educational approach in, in your business and really learned what you needed to learn to take it to the next level. Um, education's a massive thing. So to be a, I guess, a successful broker, you need to, you know, invest in yourself do sales training, um, go out to the PDAs, educate yourself as much as you can as a broker. But then when you're running a business, you will need to know uh, that's another kettle of fish. So you need to educate yourself on that side of things. So it could be that you have to go to management courses or go to team leadership courses if you've got a, a team of four or five or ten. But constant education is it, it, it's in all aspects of, of, of a broken life, not just sitting there trying to learn niches. It's actually – you know, educating and working out if you've got the right process. Your business might not be running this right process, so you might have to do Kaizen. Or you might need to speak with other brokers and see what their processes are and that you're not double handling on things. So education, uh, it's right up there. Couldn't agree more. And the one thing that blew my mind is when I became a business owner, I didn't realize how much content is out there. So one of the things I was looking into is that um, referrals. And I saw there's actual specific courses written on how to get more referrals in your business. So it's phenomenal what information is out there that you can actually. There's heaps. There's heaps. There's business coaches. There's referral people that teach uh, how to get referrals. In saying that, there's a there's there's a lot of um, well, I don't think good businesses out there teaching how to do referrals. But there, there are some that are that are exceptional and the rest, I don't really rate them much. So Hank, final question. What advice would you give to brokers entering the industry that are brand new to the uh, to mortgage broking? The biggest, uh, I have conversations with bro- uh, new brokers all the time. Um, they do reach out and they have a chat. The, the, the first question I always tell them, it's look, it's not easy. 
I've been doing this and you've been doing this for however long and you're still pulling 12, 14 hour, uh, 14 day, uh, 14 hour days. It's one, where are you going to get clients from? Now, uh, a lot of people sit there and go, oh, I'll get it from my soccer club and I'll get, I'll get it from this person or that person. The, the best referrals where a lot of brokers are coming out of is accountants, lawyers, um, real estate. So you need to actually have a very strong referral source. Because it's gone are the days where you can knock on someone's door and try to do their home loan. So having the clients is very, very important. And there's actually a lot of businesses out there that actually um, provide leads, some good, some bad. And that, that's, that's an option to start, but it shouldn't be the main option. You should be going in there knowing that you, you potentially have one or two sources of business. And then once you've built your book up to 50 to 100 people, you can work that book and then uh, pretty much create more networks from existing clients. Love it. Hank, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely fine, man. My big three takeaways from this episode was one, data will set you free as it'll allow you to pulse check your progress, whether or not you're moving forwards or backwards. It could be likened to having a bucket of water. With a hole in it, you can work very hard in continuously putting water and filling it up. By simply plugging it, you can get further, faster, and with less hassles. Two, it's keeping front of mind. Now, there's more than one way to do this, but Hank's way is phenomenal, and that's essentially adding your clients to Facebook. What this does is create a connection, and by you engaging in their life and they engaging in your life, you will be front of mind guaranteed. And the third and final is education, one in which is dear to my heart. I absolutely love this. Essentially, it's learning and learning and learning everything you can. So policy for one would be a good start, but once you've mastered the policy and niches of the banks, the world is your oyster. Whether you want to get better at sales, marketing, or even how to get more referrals from a business coach, there are programs out there designed to help you get better at whatever aspect of your business you want. So they were my big three takeaways. What about you? We love to hear them. Share your thoughts on our private Facebook page. Simply search topbroker.com.au.